The next two slides are, uh, I find, rather interesting because they, they are a depiction of most of the symptoms that folks with chronic fatigue syndrome report. And I'm going to flip back and forth for a second, and the reason why will become obvious. And these are symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. Note that orthostatic folks with orthostatic intolerance have lightheadedness, headache, fatigue, neurocognitive disorder, etc. And the previous slide, which is symptoms of chronic fatigue, mirror virtually all of the symptoms of the orthostatic intolerance patients except for uh, the fatigue, which is somewhat lower down on the list, but certainly reported in orthostatic intolerance patients. Um, there, there's therefore a great deal of homology between these two patient groups, which is why we study them both. Now, for those who are not as familiar with the criteria for POTS or postural tachycardia syndrome, um, it's defined in adults as day-to-day -day symptoms of orthostatic intolerance and an increase in heart rate of greater than 30 beats per minute or a heart rate of 120 beats per minute uh, within 10 minutes of upright tilt. Uh, interestingly, this was first uh, codified and described by Schoendorf and Lowe in 1995, which is the same time frame as the uh, formalization, so to speak, of symptoms for chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, by Fukuda in 1994, so uh, that's just uh, an ironic similarity. Um, our patients, our patient cohorts uh, that we've seen over the years can be described generally uh, with these criteria. Uh, there's a preponderance of female to males. Um, many of the symptoms, uh, as in um, a chronic fatigue syndrome, are described uh, after uh, an, um, an, uh, an intervening um, infection uh, or some uh, inflammatory process. The majority are Caucasian. Uh, it occurs between menarche and menopause, uh, and it can affect uh, athletes as well. Um, what I referred to earlier in terms of control of fluid and fluid dynamics is, is graphically shown here uh, with a depiction of the human versus, for instance, a quadruped, uh, our friend the dog. Um, uh, quadrupeds uh, do not, at least as best we know, experience symptoms of orthostatic intolerance because 70% of the blood volume is at or above the heart, making the major fluids for pumping by the heart readily available. However, in contrast to quadrupeds, uh, humans, um, when standing, uh, wind up having 70% of blood volume below the level of the heart. Therefore, in order to maintain perfusion, particularly of the blood vessels that feed the brain, the heart needs a constant and steady and uninterrupted and uncompromised return of blood to the heart. And if the mechanisms for returning the blood to the heart are altered or impaired, as we believe they are in certain of these conditions, then the heart simply doesn't have enough blood to pump and people uh, experience symptoms. One of the ways that we can reproduce some of these symptoms is by strapping people onto what's known as a tilt table. I'm sure that there are several individuals, many perhaps, uh, who are listening today who have either seen uh, have considered using, uh, you know, uh, being tested by or who have actually been on a tilt table. Uh, this actually happens to be our tilt table. Uh, this is a tilt table that uh, you can see over here is, uh, is part of NASA, which is why it looks infinitely more sophisticated and certainly much more expensive than what we have because it's been paid for by our tax dollars. Nonetheless, what we do is we ask the uh, patient or subject to lie flat 
for about 20 or 30 minutes, during which time the blood equilibrates and just distributes laterally, um, we can use this gentleman here, just distributes laterally to the chest and the legs and the arm and the head. And then within a matter of seconds, the table is tilted upright to about 70 degrees. Different laboratories use different angles, but the objective is twofold. Number one, to tilt the subject to near vertical, and number two, to maintain with straps or restraining devices uh, the subject to remain motionless because one of the mechanisms that we as humans have evolved to uh, facilitate moving blood back to the heart is something that's known as uh, leg muscle pumping. So when we do the tilt, we ask the subjects to remain motionless uh, and um, we therefore impose a great um, uh, orthostatic challenge. Now here is the response in terms of heart rate and continuously measured blood pressure um, to an orthostatic challenge. Now you can see this um, individual um, who has POTS, let me get this. Uh, the individual here that has POTS uh, was diagnosed as having POTS. Uh, right over here, this vertical line is the imposition, is when we tilt the table up. So this area to the left of this line represents the subject lying uh, flat on their back, um, supine, and you can see their heart rate is average is about 60 beats per minute, and their average, this is their average blood pressure and um, you can see their blood pressure is averaging about 70, 80 millimeters of mercury. Once uh, millimeters of mercury pressure, once the table is tilted, you can see that there is a steady increase in their heart rate, which remains elevated until this point where we put the table back to supine, and you can see that their heart rate uh, comes back to its resting value. Now, interestingly enough, this individual did not faint. Uh, a faint would be demonstrated by a rapid decrease uh, in blood pressure. Now, I talked earlier about the importance of respiration. Um, this is a comparison of control subjects to subjects with POTS uh, during the imposition of a tilt and the beginning of the tilt is the first line, the end of the tilt is the second line. Let's look at the control subject first, which shows that their resting heart rate is somewhat elevated in controls, um, and then once the tilt starts, their heart rate goes up, um, and that facilitates the return of blood to the heart, um, and then when the table goes down, their heart rate um, drops to the pre-tilt level. Uh, you can see that uh, this panel here shows um, the relative respiration volume, that is how much uh, air is being exchanged through the process of breathing, and you can see that there's a bit of change but not a lot of change in the rate and depth of respiration, and you can see that uh, there isn't much change in the um, carbon dioxide, this is a measure of end tidal carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide that's blown off or, 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 or that you breathe out at the end of each expiration. Compare this, however, to subjects who have POTS, and as shown in the previous slide, once the uh, tilt is imposed, you get a steady increase uh, in heart rate, but look at what happens here to their respiration. Individuals who are orthostatically challenged, as in patients with chronic fatigue, once challenged, demonstrate a large increase in both the rate and depth of their uh, respiration. And what winds up happening since these individuals are experiencing an increase in both the rate and depth of their respiration, their end tidal CO2 drops precipitously. This is a key controller, the uh, carbon dioxide of, of many things in the body, including 
brain blood flow, and, and we'll talk about that later. So you can see here quite clearly and dramatically that there are large measurable differences in control versus POTS or uh, what we found as well uh, in, in, in patients with chronic fatigue as well.